Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to look at predestination. You know, we're given scriptures in the Bible that says you you were chosen before the foundations of this world, and that world found that word foundation is an interesting word. It's catabol in the Greek, which means the overthrow. Now, predestination is a doctrine that is taught in churches. They don't typically take it back as far as what they're supposed to. They'll just basically teach that God is the potter and we are the clay. He creates one to love and one to hate, as he would, uh, as God would say in the book of Malachi, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And Paul would speak about it in the book of Romans. Now, God didn't just create Jacob and say, well, you know, I'm going to love you and create Jacob and say, well, I'm going to hate you. And then ultimately they both grow old, they die. And then, you know, of course, Jacob gets to go to heaven because God loves him. And Esau, well, he's just cast into a burning fiery furnace. And all Esau's family, you know, those that uh, God did love, you know, they can just laugh and cheer in heaven. Why Esau is just burning in that burning fiery furnace for all eternity. You know, there's some lies, fables, and fairy tales that are taught in Christianity. And this channel's purpose is to just try to share the word of God at a simple, easy to understand level. Because I'm a simple man and I don't think that I know everything. I'm learning just like many other people are out there. So... We're going to look a little deeper into predestination. Why does God choose some before they're even born to have a destiny, such as the prophets, for an example? Well, it has to do with what happened in the age that was. When God created everybody, all his souls, all his children, everything was perfect. Satan had a very high position in his kingdom. And then pride welled up within Satan, and he felt as if he should be God, and drew one-third of God's children to worship him. And God's at, uh, wrath and anger, you know, came upon this earth and he wiped everything out and started all over again because he didn't want to have to destroy one third of those souls. So he recreated this earth that we're in, this earth age that we're in now where we're in flesh bodies so we can be tested and not have to be judged for those things that took place then. We're judged upon what we do in this life now. So... Anyway, we're going to start this off right from the get-go in the book of Jeremiah. So in Jesus' name, let's learn together. I don't know where you're at with your understanding in, the, in God's Word. You know, I've studied it for a couple years now, and, you know, i got a long ways to go. But certain things like this, if you don't understand these basic building blocks, you're never going to understand the Word of God to the level that you should, at least. So in order to understand predestination, why God would choose some, well, it's because of what they did in the age that was, because they stood against Satan. They overcame then, and God can trust them and use them for his purpose here on this earth. And typically, that's to help other people. So we're going to start in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came on to me, saying, came on to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, how could God know him before he even formed him in his mother's womb? It's because of the age that was. Obviously, Jeremiah loved God, stood against Satan and his rebellion, and God predestinated him to be the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the prophet that was basically telling the people, the king of Babylon's coming, you're going into captivity. Very similar to those that understand the truth today with the eyes to see and the ears to hear. They're basically teaching the same lesson, that you're going to be going into captivity to this one world government. And sooner or later, the king of Babylon of the end times is coming here, which is Satan himself, claiming that he's Jesus Christ. So... We're just not going to take my word for it. Let's go further into this. Now, did God speak in the Bible about an age that was? You know, most Christians, they'll beat and hammer on their Bible and tell you this world is, you know, 6,000 years old. We've only been here for 6,000 years. They'll teach you that all mankind came from two people, Adam and Eve, which we can look around us today and understand that there's different races and two white people don't have a black child. Two black people don't have a white child. Two Chinese people don't have 
a uh, an Arab child. It doesn't work that way. So there's some things that most Christian pastors are not teaching their flocks. Why? Because they probably don't know it themselves, for one. And there's probably a good reason why a lot of people don't want to know the Word of God, because they listen to people like that, and they find too many contradictions. They look at the world around them today, and things just don't make sense. Sorry, I keep having these pop-ups popping up here every two seconds, driving me up the wall. So anyway, let's learn about this age that was. You got to start right in the very beginning, right in the book of Genesis. Now the word of God wasn't written down in English. It was written down in Hebrew and in Greek and in Aramaic in places. Translated in English. And there are some translating errors throughout the King James Version of the Bible. Some people, they don't want to admit it. They just say, oh... God made the King James Version the infallible Word of God, and there's no translation errors in it whatsoever. And then you come across words like Easter that should have been translated Passover. You hear tell words like unicorn and satires being in the in the King James Version. Well, we know there's no such thing as unicorns and satires. The word unicorn should have been translated as wild ox. And there's you know other areas. Anyway. Start right chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Well, when did that happen? Does it say here? Yep, 6,000 years ago. Well, it doesn't say that. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say when. Could have been billions of years ago for all we know. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on upon the face of the deep. Now, in the Hebrew... This shouldn't have been translated as was in the English. It was tuhu vabuhu, which it was a condition. It became that way. It wasn't created that way. God didn't create this earth in, as uh, void and without form, but rather it became that way. Why? Well, because Satan rebelled and drew one third of God's children after him. It became a desolation. You'll read further on that God says himself, I did not create... The earth void and without form, I created it to be inhabited, and that's exactly what he did. And then it became void and without form. So let's go further on down to verse 26. God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth. Over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Okay, number one, there's a couple things we're going to look at here. How do you replenish the earth? <clears throat> unless it was plenished before I have a water cooler for example and I put a bottle of water in it everything all brand new now how would I replenish it while well, the water that I put in it would have to be all gone then I could replenish it with a new bottle of water just like God had created in the beginning the heaven and the earth he created all his sons all in perfect spiritual bodies and then the earth became void and without form because of Satan's rebellion in the age that was. So God wiped everything out and started all over again. And this is why he would say, go forth and replenish the earth. You can't replenish something unless it was already plenished at one time before in the past. Now let's go back. And God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. This word God translated here is Elohim. And it's a plural form of God. In other words, God in the heavenly host. So God said, let us create man in our own image. In our likeness. So if you want to know what an angel looks like, well, look in the mirror. Angels look like we do. Because we were created in their image. And we were to be born into these flesh bodies in your mother's womb. 
In other words, to be born again. And when God said this, he wasn't just speaking about us. He was speaking about him himself. So if you want to know who Jesus Christ is, Jesus Christ was the image of God in a flesh body. He was God. So let's back this up. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us in the Hebrew. <coughs> Remember when God said, let us create man in our own image and likeness? Well, God was speaking of himself. And he came here born of the Virgin Mary as Emmanuel, God with us, the man Jesus Christ. Now let's just skip a couple chapters to chapter 9, and verse 6. Because many people believe that, you know, Jesus was the literal son of God. And in a sense, he was in this flesh body, but he was God as a flesh man. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay, so who is Jesus Christ? He is wonderful. He is counselor. He is the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. So, who is Jesus Christ? He was God, Emmanuel. God with us in a flesh body. <clears throat> See, God wouldn't have us do something that he wouldn't do himself. The only difference is he came here and he lived the perfect life. So he could pay for our sins. You can read of that in uh, chapter 53. So now let's go to 45, Isaiah 45, to hear more about this age that was and how God did not create this earth void and without form, but he created it to be inhabited. So we're going to start 45 and verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. The same word vain is the same thing, the same word as void is to who. He did not create it to who, he formed it to be inhabited and that's exactly what he did in the beginning. But it became to who, vabuhu. It became that desolation because of that rebellion that Satan had caused in the age that was when he thought that he was just the greatest thing since sliced bread and caused one third of God's children to follow after him to worship him. So God destroyed this earth and caused us to be born again into these flesh bodies. <coughs> you know, it's, when you understand these basic building blocks of the word of God, it begins to fall together into your mind your understanding so you begin to understand what God is really saying here because I'll admit the Bible is a confusing book to understand especially with all the symbolism and things like that used but once you begin to understand the basics which is basically the meat of God's word once you understand what salvation is you should begin to get into the deeper things to understand that perhaps you have a destiny as well and that's the whole purpose of this is to understand predestination in order to understand predestination, you have to understand that there was an age that was. And then we can, I don't know, maybe figure out who you are, I suppose. So we just learned God did not create the world in vain. He created it to be inhabited. That's exactly what he did until Satan rebelled. Is this spoken about in the New Testament? Yep, absolutely. So we're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds 
by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles of our Lord and Savior. What we, we just got done reading, we're, we were reading in the prophets. We read in Jeremiah, we read in Isaiah. The words of the holy prophets, which were whose words? They were God's words spoken through these prophets. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, and all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heaven were of old, and they are standing out of the water and in the water. This of old means ancient. You know, when? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, when was that? Well, it was of old, of ancient. Not 6,000 years ago. It could have been billions of years ago for all we know. We're not going to know everything in these flesh bodies, but our Father gives us, uh, I don't know, sort of a dim view of the things that were in the age that was. It's enough to understand that there was an age before this. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now we're talking about the age that was, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. We're not talking about Noah's flood. Remember where we read, God said, go forth, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish it from what? From this flood. This is where God shook the earth. And you, you'll read that here further on in another chapter. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, we're talking about this age of the flesh that we're in now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You know, we're talking here up until the millennium. And then after that thousand year millennium, then comes the great white throne judgment where all those that refuse to love God and want to love Satan are going to perish. They're going to be blotted out of existence in the lake of fire, not burning for all eternity, just simply blotted out. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. This is where we get the Lord's day from when, when we hear about our father would say many times in that day, you know, he's speaking about the Lord's day, that thousand year millennium. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish in the lake of fire, I added them in the lake of fire, but that all should come to repentance. Now, this is the whole purpose of us being here, is so we don't have to perish in the lake of fire, that we're basically given a second chance. Now, some of us have been justified before we're even born into these flesh bodies. Because we overcame in the age that was. Now, who were these people that overcame? Well, I don't exactly know. I can only go by what's written. But anyway, there you saw that we're talking about the age that was. This flood is not the same as Noah's flood. And God said, go forth and replenish the earth. Well, replenish it from what? From that huge flood where God wiped everything out. You can find clamshells up on Mount Everest. You can find trees standing upright through multiple layers of rock. And the pseudoscientists will try to tell you every layer of rock took, you know, millions and millions of years to form. So if that is logical, how, have you ever seen a tree stand up for millions and millions of years? Why rock, why rock layers are forming up it? No, it's not logical. So what happened? Well, well, there's a huge flood and a whole lot of different density materials floating around. They all settle at different rates. So the heavy material, materials settle first, the lighter ones settle after that creates layers. Scientists, they can prove that, but they certainly can't prove it took millions and millions of years for these rock layers to form up around a tree standing upright. That tree wasn't standing there for millions of years when rock layers were forming around it. That's just dumb. But this is the garbage they teach you in school. <coughs> okay, we just heard about the destruction. The world that then was that overflow with water perished. Now let's look at when God did this. For that, we need to go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sought as children. 
basically this word sottish means they're stupid children and yeah it's not hard to see today kids eating Tide Pods and snorting condoms up their noses like think about it and they have none understanding they are wise to do evil but to do good they have no knowledge I beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void same word void to who and the heavens and they had no light I beheld the mountains and lo they trembled and all the hills moved lightly I beheld and lo there was no man and all the birds of the heaven fled why was there no man man while well, we're reading of this flood that God caused to come upon this earth in second Peter chapter 3 that's what second Peter's speaking about remember he mentioned the prophets well this is what we're reading the prophets I beheld and lo the fruitful place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger so where, where were these cities? Well, obviously there were cities in the age that was. And God wiped them out. And his fierce anger. He was very angry that Satan would do this to him. To betray him like this. To draw one third of his children to run after him. These created beings that God loved. And to have them do that to God. It must uh, hurt our father very much. For thus... Hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. And he didn't make a full end. He created this age of the flesh where we could all be born into it, innocent of every, anything that took place in that age that was, to be tested here whether or not we would choose God or Satan. Remember, God is long-suffering. It's not his will that any should perish, but all come to repentance. That's the whole purpose. Our, our Father wants us to... To learn some lessons here and, and repent to love him to come back to him and you know be given the kingdom of heaven for all eternity so you know we have a very loving father when you understand him and and what he teaches and even the fact that the ones that don't overcome in this flesh age he set aside a thousand year millennium when satan's locked away in the pit so they can be taught without any type of influence from satan there's going to be no more lies at that time there's going to be no wondering, is there such thing as a God? Well, of course there is, because you're going to be standing right there. Jesus Christ is going to be right there. You're going to see him with your eyes. You're going to hear him with your ears. And there's going to be no more of this garbage that there is no God, because everybody's going to know that there is a God. And thank the good Lord that he's going to give him an opportunity to overcome during that thousand-year millennium. As in the last study, when Jesus died was buried and resurrected those three days he went into that prison the wrong side of the gulf for all those souls were being held and offered them salvation all the way back to the beginning before salvation was offered you know we can't understand our father's mind you know how could you understand his mind but his mind is good towards us and and he'll everybody that can be saved will be saved but our father's certainly not going to beg people to love him that's just not going to happen they don't want to love him. Well, see you later, Jack. We don't need you around. <clears throat> okay, so we looked at quite a few examples. Are there more? Yeah, there's a lot more examples of this throughout the Word of God. I can't go into every single one. It would take way too much time. And this is just one part. You know, we're looking at predestination. We're just laying the foundation of understanding that there was an age before this one. There's a lot more to learn, and we're going to get to that. I'm not going to go into that all today because the hamster up in my brain gets tired after a while and I need to study a little bit more for myself. But we're going to go to the book of Job, chapter 38. Now, Job is a type of God's elect. And you can see the controversy between God and Satan within this book. Where God was quite proud of Job. You know, he was perfect in all his ways. And Satan said, oh yeah, we'll take your hedge of protection down around him and I'll have him cursing you to your face. So God allowed Satan the opportunity to persecute Job. And that's what Job's name means, is persecution. And Satan had Job's family killed, his sons, had all of his wealth taken away, had his wife basically go against him 
And then he added three of his buddies go and persecute him and say basically he was no, no good piece of trash. And this is why God was doing all these things to him. When in reality, we know that it wasn't God. God just allowed Satan to do it. <clears throat> and if you happen to be God's elect today, well, you better expect some of these things to come upon you. Because I can see within the book of Job the unpardonable sin taking place where Satan is trying to get Job to curse God. Well, when Satan comes here claiming that he's Christ, and if you happen to be one of God's very elect, that God's going to have you delivered all the way up to Satan to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, what do you think Satan's going to do? He's going to try to get you to curse God and worship him. And you know that if you understand the word of God, that sin's unpardonable for you. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, you're no better than Satan and the fallen angels because you knew better. <coughs> But anyway, through 38 chapters, you're listening to Joe's buddies sitting there, make false accusations against him with all their words of wisdom. And there's actually preachers out there that preach the words of these three knuckleheads. I've actually had a Christian come here quoting me what these knuckleheads were saying. And I was kind of laughing on the inside because I remember my pastor saying that these pastors would teach these uh, verses from these three knuckleheads. And you'll hear God asking, Joe, where are you listening to these three knuckleheads for? They didn't know what was going on. They were just making their own assumptions as to why all these things were happening. But they didn't understand that the controversy in heaven was between God and Satan. And God was allowing this to happen to him. Because God knew the man that Job was and that Job loved him. I don't know, do you love God enough that you'd be willing to go and be tested by Satan? Will God have enough trust in you to even allow that to happen? Well, I don't know. So anyway, here finally God speaks. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Well, if you understand, we just could not listen to these three knuckleheads giving all their words of wisdom from their elders and this, that, and the other. Gird up not thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Just hang on a second, guys. I can't pause this and my dog's whining to be let out. Okay, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou has understanding. Well, obviously, Job doesn't know. We're talking about when God first laid the foundations of the earth. You can read about it in Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom speaks, and God basically speaks before he even created the earth, that wisdom was with God. Declare if thou has understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Well, obviously Job doesn't know all these things. Who does? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is an interesting verse here. Where were you, Job? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now God has just asked him, where were you when I laid the foundations, when I created this earth? When the morning stars sang together, yeah, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. What are we talking about? We're talking about in the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth. He created the heaven and the earth to be inhabited. He created his children and perfect spiritual bodies and everything was perfect. In Ezekiel 28, God addresses Satan as the king of Tyre, or the king of Tyrus, one or the other. And he says, you were perfect in all your ways. You were, you were the cherubim that covereth. You know, he was a protecting cherubim of the mercy seat. There's other translations where the 12 stones that were in Aaron, the first high priest's breastplate, were Satan's covering. Whether you want to believe it or not, I, it makes sense to me. That if Satan was covered with those 12 stones, that perhaps he was even a high priest in that age that was. Until iniquity and evil was found within him. This is what God is speaking of here. Job doesn't understand, but you and I can understand that Job was there. But he certainly doesn't know it. Why? Because he wasn't taught it, obviously. 
but we are we have the completed work we have all the books we have all the prophets we have the Holy Spirit that will open up our eyes to understand these things God wants you to understand these things and only he can open up your eyes so you can even understand these things to begin with and if you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear you better thank God that you do because there's not a lot of whole people that do out there they claim they do and you hear these Christians, oh, you got to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear to understand that you're not even going to be here from tribulation. You know, you're going to be gone after chapter four in the book of Revelation. The churches are no longer spoken of. Well, they don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear because if they did, they would understand that in chapter 11, the two golden candlesticks are spoken of there. The two no fall churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia. So obviously the church is still spoken of after chapter four. Anyway, I just find it funny. Sorry, I gotta let my dog back in now. Now we're getting somewhere right starting to understand that you know there was an age before this this is pretty interesting right I remember when I first started listening to these things be taught and it just fascinated me and I just loved hearing it and I spent hours upon hours upon hours upon hours being taught these things so I don't know does that have something to do with having the eyes seen and the ears to hear well perhaps it does I don't know I don't like to toot my own horn a whole lot but yeah, I found it very interesting. And once I started to understand these basic building blocks, to understand predestination, they have to understand there was an age before this one to even truly understand what predestination is. And it leads you into other things. If you don't understand what the sin in the garden was, you're never going to understand the depth of God's word that you should understand. <clears throat> okay, so we've looked at a bunch of examples in the Old Testament. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 3 and do a quick refresher here. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And why am I just rereading that again? Because all these things were written in the holy prophets. And what have we been reading in? The prophets. So somebody tells you that you don't need to understand the Old Testament. The law has been done away with. You don't even have to understand. That's just that's just history. There's nothing to even be understood there. Well, they don't know what they're talking about in the least bit. And you should run as fast as you can away from them. Now, did Jesus teach these things? Of course he did. Jesus was God in the flesh. So let's go to the Gospel of John in chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came by Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Well, yeah, it's pretty obvious. You're raising people from the dead, healing the sick and the blind everybody, and everything else. It's not a common thing. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this word, born again, I'm sure you've heard that. Hey, brother, have you been born again? Have you been born again? Somebody ever ask you that? Give them your age. I will. And if they ask me that, I say, Yeah, I've been born again for 37 years. And watch the smoke curl out of their ears as they're trying to understand that statement. Jesus will explain it here. Nicodemus say unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb, womb and be born? He doesn't understand these things. He's seen the world through his flesh eyes. He doesn't understand the spiritual things. And him being a leader, a Pharisee, he should understand all these things. Why? Because he had the Old Testament, just like I do, just like you do, that we're reading right now. 
that he should have understood that there was an age before this one and that there was a rebellion that took place. He, they have all these, they had all those scriptures there at that time. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What do you mean? What does he mean be born of the water? Well, we're born in her mother's womb and in her waters in the womb. And what's your spirit? That spirit is what God places within that child that is in the mother's womb, in the water. And then spirit, that spirit that God places within you. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's right. Paul speaks about this quite regularly. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, he speaks about the differences between the two bodies. The terrestrial body and the celestial. The terrestrial, your flesh and bone body here that you see through this uh, computer screen. And the spiritual body that you can't see. That when you die, that spiritual body goes immediately back to her father who gave it to begin with. This is what Jesus is speaking of here. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot not tell whence it came, and whether at it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Well, you obviously can't see the Spirit going in to the mother's womb into that child. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Jesus would always say, "It is. have you not read? It's written. All the things, Jesus didn't teach anything new. He was teaching everything that was already written down to begin with. We just get on reading of it in Isaiah chapter 7, chapter 9, who Jesus Christ was. He was God as a flesh man here on this earth. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So, what's Jesus saying here? No man goes to heaven unless he came down from heaven. How? When God places that spirit within the mother's womb. My wife is pregnant here now. We're going to be having a child. And sometime during this nine months, God is going to place that spirit within that child that is going to be born of the waters. It's not complicated, right? Like it's not. It's not that complicated. <clears throat> that was the whole purpose of this age of the flesh was to be born again in these flesh bodies to be tested. Now there's one problem though. There are some of these angels that didn't come down born in these flesh bodies. They left their first habitation, which means they left heaven and came down here to this earth. And we read about this in Genesis chapter six. This is why Jesus said, no man can go to heaven unless he came down from heaven. While these, they didn't come down from heaven. They directly disobeyed our heavenly father and they've earned themselves a death sentence. These are known as the fallen angels and Nephilim, whatever you want to call them. They're Satan's boys. And when Satan is cast out of heaven to this earth, as you can read in Revelation chapter 12, these angels are coming down with them. Why? Because they've already been down here to begin with when they weren't supposed to be. Trying to interfere with God's plan. Turning basically this earth into their intergalactic whorehouse. And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and he took wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh yet. His days shall be 120 years. Up to this point, you know, they were living to be 900 years old. Well, God changed things, so they weren't going to live to be that old, saying the limit is about 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old and renowned. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on earth and aggrieved him at his heart. 
In other words, it grieved our Father that he created man in the flesh, especially with what Satan and the fallen angels were doing here, corrupting everything of his. I'm sure that hurts our Father very much. You know, we're, you can read in Revelation chapter 4 that he created us for his pleasure, which means he wanted children. He wanted us to love, and he wanted us to love him in return, to have his children that he created and gave them everything to sit there, turn their backs on him, rebel against him. That's quite a betrayal, and I've been betrayed in my life. I'm sure many of you have been betrayed in your life, and it hurts. And our Father hurts just as much as you and I do. We're created in his image. So these fallen angels, they didn't come down like you and I did as a spirit in our mother's womb from who you were in the age that was. No, they just left their first habitation, came down here, took the daughters of Adam, and started having hybrid children with them. They became giants, the men of renown, very evil and wicked men, I'm sure. <clears throat> and how am I sure? Well, God says so here. And you can learn about this in uh, the book of Jude. Now, let's go there now, because the book of Jude speaks of these fallen angels. And these fallen angels are coming down with Satan. They've already been judged to perish, but they have not been named. There's only one person that's been na given by name that's going to perish. And that's Satan. And this is why Paul would refer to him as the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's not, the Antichrist is not Barack Hussein Obama. He's not Donald Trump. He's not your ex-wife. He's not your ex-husband. There's only one man that's been named to perish, and that's Satan himself. He will be here as, claiming that he's Jesus Christ. It's not a multiple choice question. And once you understand these basics in the Word of God, well, then you can take it from there. If you're not taught these things, well, chances are you're not going to be learning the truth. You're going to be learning truth mixed with lies, which are going to lead many people to worship Satan. And I'm not just ripping on rapture believers. There's a very big denomination. I think there's about 8 million of them that are taught that Satan and the angels were cast out of heaven in 1914. And then they read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, where it says the gospel must first be preached to all the world. And they're running around beating on everybody's door, trying to get them converted into their church. And if they think Satan and the angels have already been cast out of heaven to this earth, and then suddenly a bunch of fallen angels start appearing, and one of them claims that he's Jesus Christ, who are they going to worship? And it's the elders of these churches that teach them these things. And that's the whole purpose of God having an election in this final generation for the purpose that they'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Because a lot of these Christians are wonderful people on the inside. They, they try to serve God the best they can, but they've been misled. Well, at least they'll get to hear the Holy Spirit speak through God's elect and they'll make their decision there. In the final book, in Malachi, our father said he was going to send us Elijah the prophet and he was going to separate the hearts of the children to their fathers, plural. In other words, it means there's going to be a separation. Either you're going to choose Satan as he claims to be Christ, or are you going to choose our Heavenly Father as he returns as King of King and Lord of Lords, as Jesus Christ at the seventh trumpet? Either you're going to choose the sixth trumpet Jesus, or are you going to choose the real Jesus who comes at the seventh trumpet? Okay, let's, let's go to the book of Jude. We're going to learn about these that left their first habitation. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old, ordained to this common condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about these fallen angels in Genesis chapter 6. Now, how did they deny God and Jesus Christ? Because they did not come here like you and I have, born in our mother's womb. They left their first habitation, which we're going to read right now. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. 
and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. <clears throat> These angels have already been judged. Why? Because they left their first habitation. They didn't come here. Jesus said the only way you can go to heaven is you had to have come down from heaven. How? Through the water and through the spirit. Meaning what? That our father places that spirit within your mother's womb where you're floating around in her waters of her womb. Our father places that spirit within that child. You're tested here to choose God or Satan. And then when you die, you go immediately back to our father. Now these angels, they didn't come here that way. Rather, they knew what God's plans were for this age that we're in now. And they decided not to stick around up there. They decided to come here and go against God's plan. Bad move for them because now they've been sentenced to perish. It's not going to take place at the great white throne judgment after the thousand years are finished when Jesus Christ returns. You can read of it in Revelation chapter 11 that they're going to be destroyed immediately when Jesus Christ returns. And Satan is cast into that abyss or pit or whatever you want to call it with a chain upon him for a thousand years. He can no longer influence the things of man today because that office of uh, power that he's given the the beast, the false prophet and dragon, well, he'll never have the office of the beast, which is just his one world political religious system. He'll never have his role as a false prophet as he claims to be Christ because all those things are going to be destroyed. The scales are going to be taken off people's eyes. They're going to see Satan for exactly who he is. They're going to know there's a God. Why? Because he's going to be right there. And then there's going to be a thousand years of discipline taught. And then Satan's released to gather whoever is going to follow him then. And then they're going to be blotted out. And our God, our Father did everything that he could do to reconcile things with his children, to give them the opportunity to love him, to overcome. It's no longer by grace at that time. It's by their works. Why? Because, you know, we have grace now because we don't see God. You know, we believe because we read the word of God. You know, and... At that time, they'll see literally see God there in heaven for the millennium. So, anyway, this is the first part. There's a lot more to it. I'm going to do some more studying here before I attempt to do this. A lot of the times, I'll uh, check everything out. I'll go on the season.org. I'll make sure that, you know, what I'm reading that, you know, I can basically get make sure the information is accurate from those that know more than I do because I certainly don't know everything but I try you know that's all that's all a person can do right because they God we couldn't do anything to begin with so anyway the next one's coming up maybe tonight maybe tomorrow I don't know yet but I hope everything is going well in your guys's life and stay in the word of God and you know, perhaps you are one of those that have been chosen before you were even born. You know, how do we know? Well, we don't know exactly. Perhaps if we didn't know, we wouldn't be putting our pants on one leg at a time anymore. We might be jumping up on our bed, jumping into our pants both legs at a time because we'd start getting a great big head upon our shoulders. So anyway, stay humble. Be kind to other people. Learn the word of God. Try to be patient with people as well. You know, myself included. Talk to you later.